has been a long time since we've done this, Ethan. Yeah, I have not been here in a while. It's good to be back. It's I'm good. glad to be back on the mic. I, I'm, I am too. It's, it's been weird because I, mean, I know COVID-19 has sort of changed a lot of things. I, I don't know if this is really a, a bad thing or not. It just sort of was a thing. I know I got yeah. caught by surprise and sort of forgot that, oh, yeah, there are some people still debating, even though they're virtual. So maybe we should do current resolution episodes. I just got so thrown by how different our lives have been over the last, I think, going oh on six gosh. weeks now. Yeah, Corona's changed everything, man. I mean, everything is flipped on its head from school, going to the grocery store. Like everything I try to do is somehow influenced by coronavirus. Even the amount of things we're trying to buy at the grocery store. Sometimes I would make multiple trips and like go at different times. It's crazy. I yeah, think, it's I, I can't wait to just grow up and tell everyone that I live during this time. This is absolutely nuts. It's definitely going to be one of those stories. I know last and all the week, free time, too. Oh, yeah, there's so much. I know last week we were, uh, try, of all things, trying to buy uh, dishwashing detergent, and it was sold out at Food Lion, except for the super cheap knockoff Food Lion brand. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't even even, I didn't even know they sold that at Food Lion. <laughs> I didn't either. I was like, "What?" I, it's it's the sort of stuff like it's it comes in a box and With it's that, got like, powder little, or something. Yep, it's got that little yeah. metal pull out tab thing that looks like it's from 1955. <laughs> like and... Baking soda. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of What's the Res? My name is Josh Herring. I'm a humanities instructor, debate coach, and dean of students for Thales Academy at Rollsville, North Carolina. I'm so excited that uh, Ethan and I are back to our normal kind of show. Uh, and today we're going to be focusing on the Nationals Lincoln Douglas resolution that, uh, at least we're recording this on May 2nd, so this was released yesterday. We're going to try and get this episode up as quick as possible. That resolution is resolved. The intergenerational accumulation of wealth is antithetical to democracy. Ooh, this is going to be a good one. This I, is so unique. This is not like the other LD resolutions at all. Yeah, we've not had. I mean, this is I, I remember our episode with Crawford. He told me that uh, at least the, the LD wording committee tries to think up resolutions that will be political, economic, and philosophical, and very broad in scope for nationals. And this certainly seems to be that. Yeah, this, well, those are really broad categories. You could fit a lot of those categories, but this one is, I feel like you could draw pretty much all of those together. I think like, so. This is just so different than all the other ones. Where's the ought? There's no ought. You're not, you're not trying to prove the presence of a moral imperative. You're just trying to prove the existence of something. When's the last time we tried to do that in LD? Well, there, there's, I think there's a pretty heavily, uh, there's a pretty strong ought that's implied, but what we're, what we're assuming, what this resolution begins with assuming is that democracy is what America should be, and then intergenerational accumulation of wealth harms that, so if you affirm that democracy is what we should be heading towards, then we need to have a massive change in what the energy and how we trans and how wealth transfer occurs. Uh, and why there's... are you saying America? Is it just because like we're, that's the primary example of democracy that we can and that has intergenerational accumulation of wealth that we could go off of? Not really. I mean, really. I mean, every every democracy that I'm aware of has intergenerational accumulation of wealth, and we'll talk about that convoluted four word phrase here in a minute, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> but in reality, I think I, I'm I'm thinking of America primarily here because uh, this this resolution is going to be geared towards NSDA nationals, uh, mm -hmm. and I mean I I don't know that's the only nationals tournament I can think of that is going to be happening. I mean this was written for that tournament. That of course that's going to be a virtual tournament, but still that's that's going to be what's going on. But I I mean I think I suppose you could extend that worldwide, but I, I think it'll be easiest to think of that in terms of the American context, but there's no reason the resolution doesn't restrain itself to America. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. So, what what are your initial thoughts on this resolution? And we'll kind of start working through our outline. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't see the ought. I I'm just reading the intergenerational accumulation of wealth as antithetical to democracy. I see debaters going up being like, "This is the definition of democracy," and is the intergenerational accumulation of wealth antithetical or not antithetical? It's, just, it's almost like a yes or no question. This is where like, the affirmative pretty much has to 
take the value of democracy. This is where I was confused with values too. I'm like, we're taking a value, but we're trying to prove the reality of something. Because I remember we've had so many resolutions with the word ought in it. We had the, Feb- the January, February one at Harvard, uh, nuclear arsenals. Before that, we had SAT, ACT. And I'm pretty sure there was an ought in there about removing the SAT, ACT, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. This one is just like, hey, is this antithetical or not? Like, okay. <laughs> but I, and I, I have a, I'm struggling there to, to see, or I'm struggling to, as a debater, like thinking I'm going to have to go up into a, a debate round and accept certain things in order to argue this resolution. I'm thinking more of just a broad standpoint, like all I'm trying to prove or like getting defensive here, all I need to prove is that it's antithetical or not. And that's my reaction. Like, don't, you're not going to put me in any corners in the debate round kind of thing. Well, that'll be interesting. I, I, I think you're probably burdened by a bit more than that here. <laughs> All right. We'll hash it out. Yep, That's fair. We will. Let, let's 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 start with uh, just kind of walking through terms and then we'll uh, kind of bring that together for resolution thoughts. Um, <clears throat> this phrase intergenerational accumulation of wealth fascinates me because uh, I think what we're dealing with here is the very idea of passing on wealth from the existing generation Uh, people who are working to the next generation. So the first thing I want to kind of think about is like, what is wealth? I mean, how do you define wealth? It's, 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 I guess like, well, in terms of, don't look at me like that because I know, I know what you're thinking, but. uh, No, I'm serious. It's a super broad term. True, true. I thought you were, I thought you were thinking of like, you know, the, the spiritual type of wealth or like that inward type of, yeah, I know no, <laughs> Still the no. reaction you gave me. I'm like, no, we're not going there <laughs> in terms of like how governments work, how democracies work and how intergenerational wealth filters down through society. I'm thinking mainly of assets and how, you know, through inheritance, parents will pass on their assets that they accumulated throughout their lives to their children. So there's cash investments, land, all those things would count. And then the government takes their portion of it. That's my, that's, I'd have, I think that's the main scope, I would say, although I'm sure someone's going to find some crazy thing to argue for and have a great debate round with it. Probably so. I, I think you hit the big ones. I mean, the, the whole idea here is that people work for a lifetime, but a huge motivation uh, in, in terms of basic economics, a huge incentive for why we work is in order to pass that on to children. So there's a inherently with <coughs> within a democratic a set, a democratic setup is the idea that there's no structural limitation on how far you could go. Uh, you could look to just the, some of the early 20th century uh, robber barons for examples of people who started with nothing, and by the time they're dead, they are the richest men in America. A lot of their descendants still have huge portions of that wealth. And so this intergenerational accumulation of wealth, is I, I think it's really interesting because part of that is going to turn on just how broad or narrowly that's defined. Are we just talking about taxable assets in case if a plan or a case is going to really be built around the idea of AF going in on a huge inheritance tax? But what about, I mean, I guess all of these things on my list are, are really taxable at one level or another, but cash and investments, gold, <laughs> land, estates, uh, any kind of material value thing that can be transferred from one person to another, that's, that's what's at stake here. Um, but there's also, as we'll get, we'll get to in a few minutes, I mean, there's, uh, I think Neg has great ground here to argue that you're attacking a lot of the things that actually foundationally hold society together mm-hmm. if you attack intergenerational transfer of wealth. Uh, okay. Uh, Ethan, are you familiar with how inheritance works? Yeah. If once you're, um, or like if you, if it's a parent child kind of thing, your parents will hopefully have written a will at some point. And then when they pass away, they can pass on their inheritance to you in the form of all of those assets, cash, gold, land, all of these investments. And then once you receive that, the government will take a or tax a portion of that, a pretty large portion of that, um, up to a certain amount. I believe up to a certain threshold. Was it, if you know the threshold, I don't know what it is, maybe a million dollars. It could be less or more. Um, and then the rest of it is untaxable. I did pull that number. Uh, this is coming from the opportunity Institute. <clears throat> they have an article called the state, the state estate tax is a leveler for democracy. Uh, let's see. 
so apparently President Trump has adjusted the number back in December 2017. Uh, so that increased the threshold for federal estate tax from $5.6 million to $11.2 million. What this mm. means is you have to have an estate valued at $11.2 million before it is subject to the federal estate tax. Now, different states have state estate taxes, mm -hmm. but on the federal level, you got to have – that's a lot of money. Uh, with this increase, revenue losses to the federal government total about $10 billion annually. These billions of dollars will now add to the intergenerational transfer of wealth from the top two-tenths of 1% of estates to their descendants. I'm also reading a source right now that says the majority of estates don't pay federal estate taxes because that threshold for property is so high, mm -hmm. um, which could say something about who has the most valuable property and how, how possibly it could have gotten there, but at the same time. So that's interesting because like, it's like the problem was already there and now it can't be solved through the inheritance tax. Well, yeah, and that, that that's assuming uh, – the way you just said that is already assuming that there is a problem, that there is an inequality of wealth here rather than seeing that as kind of like the natural state of things, mm -hmm. which is going to be a huge part of this debate. I mean this yeah. is going to bring in people's views on whether or not democracy means complete equality or uh, uh, one word I thought of here is the uh, a comp uh, an egalitarian approach where there is no different – position within a democracy, but instead straight equality. Everyone starts from the same playing field uh, rather than some people beginning from a higher position because of previous generations' efforts. This is such a Jordan Peterson resolution. <laughs> where, where would JP stand on this one? Um, heavily on the negative side. Actually, well, he would affirm... Let me think. I, I can see him on the negative side, but the one thing that's keeping me from saying he would be there is that he his in most of his lectures have some or a lot of his lectures have something to do with sorts of hierarchy and how the world operates based on unequal or unequal hierarchies and why that's actually a good thing. So he might say it could be antithetical, but it's not necessarily a bad thing to have hierarchies of wealth slash competence slash whatever it may be. Yeah. So we've got uh, inherit. We've got inheritance tax. Uh, that's that's part of this. As I was digging into different sources uh, this morning, I also found quite uh, – oh, yeah. This is also a couple other things from the, uh, uh, from the Opportunity Institute. Um, white families are twice as likely to receive any kind of inheritance as black families, and these inheritances are worth 7.5 times as much as the inheritances within black families. Median white family wealth for those receiving an inheritance is $287,000. Median wealth for black families receiving an inheritance is $38,000. Black and Latinx make up about 30% of the U.S. population, but collectively own about 7% of the nation's private wealth. Now, assuming that data is correct, what it points to is that um, through no effort of their own, uh, white folks have a much higher likelihood of starting their own economic advantage or their economic activities from a position of advantage. And black and Latinx folks are much less likely to do the, do so. True. And I guess the refutation to that would be it's not necessarily through no effort of their own because it's from a previous generation's effort on their behalf. And I guess even go back on a sort of infinite regression kind of thing there. I guess the thing to do, just like with any other resolution, whenever we have a racial disparity that's really shocking on the surface level, it's good to dig into the um, the links and the link chains in there to make sure we're identifying where exactly the problem is. Mm -hmm. And that that just makes the argument like, you know, exponentially stronger. We did this with the LD drugs resolution. I'm pretty sure we did it with SATACT was another one. Um, and doing due diligence there just like does amazing things for a debate case. It, that, that's so true. Yeah. And in this case, there's uh, there's there's a longstanding argument that uh, the American economy as a whole is based on the our current the current dis racial disparities in wealth are the result of uh, the uh, slavery in the United States stretching from the early 1600s through the middle of the 1800s. And yep. that you have families that were able to capitalize on the slave labor and not having to pay for la that labor. Uh, and then they built all that capital and they've transferred it and invested it such that you get 
families with trust funds that go back for multiple generations that ultimately are founded on slave labor. Uh, and that's just a totally, which makes this a, th that would be a very interesting, I think that's going to be would a make legitimate, for a good debate. yeah, that would, that'll be a yeah. legitimate AF argument. I think that you could easily mm -hmm. bring in here to say that, uh, this, if you ran justice as your value and then, uh, racial equality as your value criterion or something like that, you could then make, build your case around the fact that, uh, the status quo is really unjust and that through putting this, affirming today's resolution, we will actually bring about a better state of justice between races. Right. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, okay. Let's see. That's on the same idea. Uh, okay. Now, one of the big, um, I, as I was digging into this, uh, one article from, uh, there's a journal called the Annual Review. Let me pull that mm -hmm. full title up. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, so this is the Annual Review of Political Science. Uh, the authors on this journal article are Kenneth Sheev and David Stasevage. Uh, looks like Sheev is from Stanford University and Stasevage is from New York University. Uh, there, there were two guys who came up in this journal article and also a Washington Post article. They seem to be some of the bigger names on this kind of issue. Um, they argue that there's really... Uh, three reason they've got three factors that they want to con they consider uh, in terms of this. The first of those is that uh, they look at that citizens without wealth might be divided by other what they call social cleavages or things that divide people in society, such as religion or ethnicity, and those other social cleavages could uh, inhibit the adoption of wealth equalizing policies. So. Their argument is that, in fact, uh, it might not, it's not just wealth that divides people in society. It's also political affiliation, religious affiliation, social uh, variation, geography, uh, cultural stuff, all these other things that might make people really resistant to wealth equalizing policies. They uh, go on to write the second way in which democratic politics has a contingent effect on wealth inequality has to do with citizen beliefs about the fairness of policies that redistribute wealth. It's often assumed that those with less wealth want redistribution, but support also depends on whether citizens think those policies are fair. Whether citizens think wealth equalizing policies are fair depends on the particular fairness criterion they themselves hold. I thought that one was really interesting because uh, a lot of these articles are making the argument on the AF side that if we have a redistribution kind of mechanism, well, that will solve all of this. But uh, these two authors found that really if you uh, – you, you, most people think that redistributing wealth of taking wealth from the rich and simply giving it to those who are not yet rich, that's really unfair. And so that kind of policy would ultimately be pretty – they'd be resistant to that. Uh, the third thing they consider is what they call captured democracy. And this is one of the big questions, I think, of this debate. Uh, and they, just, they write about captured democracy. If the wealthy are able to exert disproportionate influence on government, despite the principle of one person, one vote, then they may use this influence to block policies that equalize wealth. It's not hard to think of how this might occur. The real question is whether we can trace the importance of capture across countries and over time. Simply <coughs> observing that wealth inequality is high and then inferring that there must be capture is not a very uh, convincing empirical strategy. So the whole idea of a captured democracy is also huge for this debate. Uh, do we actually have a democracy that is truly government by the people or do we have something else going on here where uh, the rich are exercising their influence disproportionately and stealing democracy, basically, uh, the trouble with that is that it makes a great fear narrative, but at least according to these authors, there's not much empirical data on that whole idea. Not much empirical data and even more so not so much warrant because they have, a, I mean, they have a decent list of questions. Like why exactly are people different? If you're going to attribute that to a system of government, you've got a lot to prove. And I think that article does a really good job of pointing that out because they, they named ethnic differences, religious differences, all of which could have an impact on how exactly wealth is distributed in a society. So it's it's true. Whoever's advocating on behalf of democracy does have 
has to draw a link chain somewhere. It's not like they have to cover the entire concept. They could pick a certain avenue of argumentation, just like with any other resolution, and argue that way. But it's certain the capture democracy is really an interesting idea. So there's definitely a lot to be thought about there. But I think that was a really good summary. That's that's a good skepticism in the form of a question towards the affirmative side, I would say. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, oh, uh, let's not skip over antithetical. Uh, I, right. I, I don't think my dictionary.com definition is particularly stellar or unique, but uh, they define it as directly opposed or contrasted, opposite. And I think that's where you get, if there's an implied ought in this, it's in the strength of the term antithetical. Because okay. we're assuming that democracy is what we should be, particularly in America, but generally in the rest of the world. Uh, the, the age of monarchy seems to have passed away. Though, oddly enough, uh, I, I've seen some really interesting speculations about COVID-19 leading to the rediscovery of authoritarian power. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, I mean, uh, I know I, uh, we, we were talking back and forth the other day about the, uh, the article about uh, Governor Whitmer in, uh, in Michigan. Yeah. Uh, she is uh -oh, rather, man. seems to be rather enjoying the ability to issue infinite executive orders regardless well, of Well, if the rest of us says. act like, like the people in Michigan did, I don't think we have anything to worry about. <laughs> well, yeah, mm. there's that. Uh, who, who knew Michigan had that many people who were concerned about their liberties? That's, that's Yeah, and speaking of, speaking of gun rights, like just as a side note, you know, um, Trudeau in Canada just banned, like, banned assault weapons from what? from circulation in Canada. No, yeah, they're I gone. didn't see that. He's working on handguns too. So it's they're have they're having a two year phase out plan or like a two year grace period to get rid of all of the whatever assault rifles are supposed to be or like military grade assault weapons. They are gone now. Interesting. Well, that, yeah. that <laughs> quick side note. I've just been watching a lot of videos about that recently. I think it's really interesting. Uh, that, that I wonder, no, that won't have anything to do with next year's policy resolution. Uh, that and this is on, all because, this is all because a dentist got a hold of a weapon and then just went door to door <laughs> shooting people, but they don't know what kind of weapon it was, <laughs> oh goodness, nor where terrible. it was acquired. Uh, well, uh, maybe that dentist was inspired by Parks and Rec's Jeremy Jam, but <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so Ethan, uh, I'll, I'll run through the differences in formal definitions, but without looking at a formal definition, how would you define democracy? What comes to mind when I think of democracy is gov government by the people, where w the intention is to have equal representation, and then everybody comes together and votes on what would be best for the majority based on what the majority thinks. Yep. I, I, I think that's probably a good working definition that's in that fits what most people kind of naturally think about when we think about democracy. Um, a lot of what comes in. So uh, you've got two Greek words pushed together. The demos is the people. Kratos is the law. Uh, etymologically, we're dealing with the law from the people is kind of the idea, as opposed to a monarchos or a single ruler or an aristocratos or a uh, rule of the noble people or rule of the few people. Uh, now, uh, back to that stellar source that uh, I think most people start with, uh, if you don't find a, a better one, uh, dictionary.com lists five different definitions. Their first one <coughs> is a, pretty similar to what you were just saying, government by the people, a form of government in which the supreme power is vested in the people and exercised directly by them or by their elected agents under a free electoral system. Uh, the free electoral system is key there. Uh, this, res this definition does include a sort of uh, combination of what previous generations would have called a republic or a, uh, a representative democracy, uh, since it's either direct voting or it's voting by their elected agents. But this is pretty key for understanding why Congress people and senators get to make laws. They are they don't have any special powers in and of themselves. They are exercising the power delegated to them by the people that they represent through the action of the vote. Second definition is a state having such a form of government, the example being the United States and Canada are democracies. Thirdly, a state of society characterized by formal equality of rights and privileges. So notice we've shifted in that third definition. Now we're talking about a state of society rather than a form of government. Uh, that's, that's, that's a difference. 
In which case, that that's looking more at kind of the ways people arrange themselves in how they build a society. The fourth one is even more different, the political or social equality, with the example being democratic spirit. So here uh, we have democracy not as a noun but as an adjective, and looking more at the <coughs> general equality before the law, uh, and uh, even in terms of social privileges. And their final definition is the common people of a community as distinguished from any privileged class. The common people with respect to their political power. That fifth definition is already presenting us with sort of a clash in groups of people, uh, where you have the democracy as the general working man versus the privileged class. Now, all of that then uh, comes in. I, I think a huge part of this debate is going to be how people define democracy. And I agree. Yeah, yeah that, that fourth definition, political or social equality, would already put an egg in a, in a lot of trouble if, if we were going to define democracy that way on the app, because that's already assuming like the standard is complete equality. So like any any possible way that wealth accumulation can harm equality, which you could find tons of ways for already puts this in the in the in favor of the app. So I think a, a good like I, I can see Neg definitely going for one of those first definitions where we keep it a little more general. I think so. And, and there's, if you, depending on your definition, it's much easier to talk about why everyone should have an equal, an equal starting point in terms of money and why yeah. anything that might be described as privilege is inherently bad or wrong for such a society. If we're talking about equality before the law, that's something that theoretically should not be shaped by how much money a family has. But if we're talking about uh, general social equality, well, then there's no way that a poor person from lower Alabama is going to be in a same position of social equality as someone who grew up uh, in upper Manhattan and trailer park versus a brownstone in New York City. Those are going to be completely different starting points in society. So depending on democracy, a lot changes uh, for this resolution. Uh, OK. Uh, I've been talking quite a bit. Uh, Ethan, can you, do you have the outline pulled up? I do. I have it right here. Excellent. Uh, can you read the, the big quote? This is still coming from that journal article I mentioned a few minutes ago at, uh, yeah. C.2. <laughs> All right. So what is the effect of wealth inequality on the emergence and sustainability of democracy? What is the impact of democratic government on wealth inequality? If one were asked to sum up the received wisdom about these questions, it would be that wealth inequality is bad for democracy, and yet democracies are also likely to implement policies that reduce wealth inequality. The simple reason for this is that those with no or little wealth are more numerous and therefore have more votes than the wealthy. This same pattern has already been noted for democratic policies and income inequality. These two authors are the most heavily cited proponents of the idea that democracy involves equalizing policies, although these authors have been challenged on multiple fronts, and some of their own recent empirical work suggests a different conclusion. Because of the distribution of wealth is almost invariably more equal than is the distribution of income, the same argument should apply even more forcefully for wealth. Political scientists have spent a great deal of time analyzing the empirical correlates of income inequality, but far less effort has made in has been made in this area of wealth inequality. There's good reason for this. Wealth inequality data are generally much harder to come by. What that, uh, I think, uh, means for us in terms of thinking about this resolution is that there's a lot of room on both sides of this. There, there's good ground on both sides of this resolution. Uh, there's plenty of people who have made the assertion that wealth inequality is damaging to a democratic country, but they really have a – but then NEG has – NEG can focus in on the evidence and the quality of the evidence that supports that statement. And they're really the, – these guys at least, and those names were uh, – I'm probably going to butcher these – Asimoglu uh, or Ace Moglu and Robinson and Boy. And their works were published in 2000, 2006, and 2003 respectively. Uh, but they're – their arguments don't there there's not been enough research done that is done with quality evidence because that last line wealth inequality data are generally much harder to come by there's also a really interesting idea hidden in the first part of that paragraph and in the next quote that it's possible that democracy is self-regulating because once the wealth accumulates in one area if we have a if we have an area that's true to democracy like a or 
as true to a democracy as you could get, that means that you'd probably have more people who don't have as much wealth than people who have all the wealth. And if democracy is functioning the way it should, then that should change based on the way laws are made and wealth is re- redistributed throughout society. So that's interesting because maybe the affirmative or the negative could easily accuse the affirmative. If you're looking at an example of wealth inequality, you're looking at a democracy in a point of time, in a, at a specific point in time. And if you look at it this, in that specific point in time, it's going to look like wealth inequality is antithetical to democracy. But if you look at democracy over a span of time, you can see that it's more dynamic. It's like a like a cycle almost, and it's regulating itself. So different people end up having the wealth at different times. That's a great point. Uh, it makes me think about the fact that uh, even though they get a terrible name, the robber barons of the early 20th century became America's first enormous philanthropist. Uh, John D. Rockefeller donated millions, uh, what today would be the equivalent of billions of dollars, to begin the nationwide network of public libraries. Uh, Vanderbilt, literally built Vanderbilt University, uh, has become one of America's leading research universities and so on. Uh, And so over time, that wealth gets filtered out into these different institutions. But then it also... You also reminded me of, uh, I, I don't know if you've ever, have you ever seen the TV show Downton Abbey? Oh my gosh. My grandparents love that show. My, my British grandpa loves that show. You can make me yeah, feel like I've an old it. person now, but okay. um, be that as it may, Downton Abbey is a great illustration of the idea that uh, it's an old aristocratic idea. And it's one of those ideas that makes a lot of sense in theory and it needs the right kind of person to make the theory come alive in a beneficial way. But the theory is that the wealthy and in Britain, that's the aristocrats, it's the landed noble nobility and gent- or the gentry. They have their position of increased wealth and responsibility so that they are able to take care of the rest of the people. Not in some necessarily patronizing way, but in the sense that they have enough money to give jobs. <laughs> and yeah. so their wealth becomes a source of job creation for other people. Now, of course, Downton Abbey, that, that's one of the running themes in that show where they're having to modernize the estate and they're always in danger of going bankrupt. Because honestly, that family is not very good at managing its money. Uh, they, they, they lose their fortunes of, like every season. Uh, but <laughs> that, that, that's really one of the ideas there that uh, you need some level of wealth in order to create opportunities for other people to make wealth. In which case, I think that might be a really good negative argument to bring in that if we remove this, what you're actually doing in order to effectually actualize the affirmative case, you would remove the ability of um, people to have enough wealth to start large companies from the get-go or to uh, invest in large companies with inherited money or even to make large companies able to continue running. Uh, all of those would be problems because that would, I mean, that would then bring in the, their inability to actually keep a modern capitalist society going. Yeah, and I'm looking at this from a more electoral standpoint. <clears throat> if you have most of the people not having most of the wealth, which is gen- that's that's going to be the pattern pretty much all the time. I, I remember there's this distribution P- Peterson talks about. I think it's the Pareto distribution, possibly. I could be completely saying that wrong. Um, or just not remembering it because I haven't watched a lecture in a while. But it's this weird um, phenomenon where it, it goes something like 20% of X has 80% of Y. And it, it was like this weird thing that it's a pattern that nature follows, kind of like a Fibonacci sequence or whatever, where like 20% of the stars have 80% of the mass, or maybe in this case, 20% of the world has 80% of the wealth. It seems to be a little less close, I guess, in the form of wealth in that aspect but um yeah it just it follows stuff like that but what what i'm thinking is if you have most of the people who don't have most of the wealth eventually people are going to get elected that intend to redistribute that wealth in some sort of way and maybe not every time because i know most people in america don't have most of the wealth and most of it's at the top just like usual and president trump got elected and he's not exactly one to redistribute redistribute the wealth everywhere. But I, I'm not saying that eventually we couldn't see a different president that would distribute it that way. But here, like the key is, even if we keep electing people who redistribute the wealth everywhere, it's still never going to be equal because you're just filtering it like a little bit more. But it's like, yeah, you can redistribute redistribute as much as you want, 
there's still going to be the 1% at the top. It just depends who it is. And if you could even take all of the wealth from the current 1%, 1% and then give it to a different 1%, which you pretty much can't. I remember when uh, back in 2011 when the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement was kind of dominating headlines for – Goodness, two months or something like that. Uh, I mean, they and they of course framed it in terms of there is we are the ninety nine and we want the one percenters to to give us their money and that sort of thing. Um, various studies crunch the numbers. If you did, even if you did take the money that the one percent has and distribute it evenly across the other ninety nine percent, you're talking about. Thousands of dollars going to people, not hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. It's not it's not status changing sums of money when you water it down that much. Uh, <laughs> a huge part of this resolution in this debate is going to come down to competing views on economics and how how actually economics works. Yeah, I completely agree. This is this is going to be a great debate. I like how it's framed a little bit differently. I'm just trying to wrap my head around how exactly would I approach it. Well, maybe some of that. Let's uh, let's shift into discussing values. Uh, Please, yes. So, okay. Uh, so, I'm assuming. Tell me what you think of this. I assume most people on AF are going to run straight to democracy as their value. Does that seem like a re? I mean, just since it's already in the resolution. Can we talk framing first? Because I feel like that's going to help with the values discussion. Sure. What would okay. you think? What do you think about framing? <laughs> okay. So the resolution says the intergenerational accumulation of wealth is antithetical to democracy. <clears throat> it's this is this is a sort of statement where someone's going to say yes or no to it. There's no ought. And just because there's no ought doesn't mean you can't attribute a value to it. But my, I just I know this is going to happen where it, because this is just the general trend in LD now. You say the values in the constructive speech and you might touch on it in the last speech. But the majority of the debate doesn't come down to the value, especially when you have something as evidence heavy as this debate could be, or not not even evidence heavy, as you as you use the word literature heavy, this debate could be. You're gonna forget about the value. And you can you can go in the last speech and run to the saving grace of this resolution that's literally just gonna be, hey, all I have to prove is yes or no. It doesn't matter if democracy is valuable. It doesn't matter if egalitarianism is valuable. It doesn't matter how the wealth gets transferred, if it's taxed, whether or not it will be taxed in the future. Is it, it's like, yo, I, um, it's like, I love democracy. You know, like I, I, I'm a huge proponent of democracy. Is this bad for democracy? Yeah. Or wait, no, no, sorry. Even, even worse or even better, I guess, depending on the way you look at it, the other way around. It's like, oh yeah, the intergenerational accumulation of wealth, like, I love that stuff. You know, like I, I love like, you know, getting money from like handed down from my grandparents, parents and everything. Is it harmful to democracy? Yeah. Okay. Like there's no value there. It's just like, yeah, I don't care if it harms democracy. It's like all in the end, all you're doing is affirming is something antithetical or not. And granted in order for it to be an LD debate in in order to be persuasive at all in an LD round, you've got to have a value because when you forget, like what you're supposed to be saying about your evidence or you're like in the middle of a debate, there's no more evidence to be said. It's like, what do you run to? Well, the value, because you just kind of have to talk until you remember something else. You're, you're going to have to run to the value to make it convincing. But at the end of the day, is it antithetical or is it not? That's, it's just a yes or no statement. Yeah. We're on two different sides on this one. Cause I would see this as a, I mean, I don't see this resolution being that simple. I don't think it's just a matter of like, Judge, I just have to meet the fact that, yes, it's clearly antithetical to democracy. That's not a really interesting debate. Where I would see this going in a much more interesting direction would be to say, okay, this is antithetical to democracy. That Take that as your premise, and then your debate is really about, therefore, what must we do because this is antithetical to democracy. This is a Bernie Sanders-style resolution. This what is must Bernie's, we do because it's yes, antithetical? Yes, yes. I like I I I think this is going to be a really interesting. This could be a very interesting plan based debate where you can get. It's less about the value, though. I still think we should talk through a list of potential values. Yeah, and it could be more about okay. So AF is probably going to run some. <coughs> AF is going to run something where they say. This is antithetical to democracy, and because we affirm democracy, we have to change everything about the way our society is currently situated. And then on the flip side, Neg is going to say, 
AF is obligated by is AF is burdened by the resolution to deny property rights, which has an enormous amount of harms. AF is going to destroy the family, marriage, and our economy. And so Neg's primary strategy here is to look at the harms that are going to result from affirming and then implementing the resolution. So I, I think you're right in that the lack of an ought makes us a little bit less of a values-based debate. It's more easily a plan-based debate. About, okay, but I, I think the – and I, I don't want to reject the resolution in order to get there. But I see this debate as being essentially uh, – I mean, I can – I wasn't kidding a minute ago. I think this is a Bernie Sanders type resolution because it calls for a revolution in, I mean, this is rejecting English common law, the constitutional framework, the highest, the valuing of property rights at the highest level uh, of the American political and legal tradition. And so this is an overturning of the status quo. This is a revolutionary resolution. So... I would not I, – I don't think it's going to – I think boiling it down to yes or no, that's all I have to prove, is missing the heart of the resolution. And I don't think judges will find it very interesting or persuasive to oh, hear a case. I doubt, just I on doubt judges yes – I wouldn't no. find that interesting at all either. The What I'm looking at it from is a standpoint like as a debater, what are the assumptions in the resolution? And when I read it, at the end of the day, what do I need to prove? Now, if you're if you're an affirmative team trying to prove that the acu the intergenerational accumulation of wealth is antithetical to, to democracy, it would do you really well to have some level of respect for democracy. Otherwise, you're just kind of standing there like, yeah, I'm chill. Like this sucks. But have you met really any debaters who say they don't like democracy? Because I've only met one, and well, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I think we're on the same page in that one. But like at the same time. You, at the end of the day, you need to prove that it's anti antithetical or not. And, but the best strategy, I'm with you on the best strategy thing. But after going to places like Harvard, I've realized that best strategy is like one of those 80-20 things. Like 80% of the people are going to use the best strategy. And then the, that 20% is going to do this thing. I don't. This might not fit into truth testing, but this might fit into one of those whack strategies where it's like, yeah, I don't value democracy at all. Is it antithetical? Yep. Have a nice day. Like I can completely seeing that see that being one of those cases out there. And Could be, but, uh, I, but I, I I would completely agree with you. Adopting a value for democracy on the affirmative side is the best way to build a good narrative to to convince the judge that intergenerational accumulation of wealth is antithetical. So I would I'm I would do what you're saying, but I have a prediction that at the end of the day, debaters will run to that bare bones, that very simple burden at the, at the heart of the debate in the last speech to kind of tie things together. Well, uh, you know what we should do? Uh, if the NSDA does what the TOC did and all of their videos are available on YouTube after the tournament, uh, we should go, uh, when this is all over, we should start at maybe like octas and <laughs> we should follow uh, the, the debate from octas to quarters to semis and finals and see if you're right. We should see which cases went out because my my suspicion is that uh, that those kind of you called them whack cases a minute ago. I don't think those are going to make it to the top of the NSDA. They might, might not make it to the top of the NSDA, but, you know, you know, when someone like I know you've been in tons of debates before when you're when you especially when you feel like you're losing. You just want to go down to the bare bones of the debates like, hey, all I have to prove is this. Here's how I've done that. And then you kind of just wait and see if see if you've done something right it's more of like a losing strategy but i i really think that the the simplicity of the burdens of this round can be extrapolated on and make it made into a really really nice debate with tons like harms is going to be a massive part of this debate i can't wait to see some of those those are going to be really well put together and i'm excited for that but at the end of the day it's it's simple burdens it's a very it is a really simple burden maybe so but let's jump back to values for a moment. So assuming that that's possible, and we'll have to wait until the tournament is over to see if you're, which of us is correct on kind of what people do. Um, I think democracy is <laughs> a very good initial foundation. Um, and it's gonna, I, I have trouble keeping democracy apart from the next, my next two value recommendations. Um, because they, these all three seem to usually be used as synonyms when people use them as values. 
But democracy, equality, and fairness all seem like they could be strong, uh, predominantly... Uh, I think they could be strong AF, or AF values on, uh, just on the surface level to understanding of all three of those terms. But I think you could also use those as negative values because you got because you could certainly look at more practical applications in the real world for the negative value of that and see how democracy does require people who have the kind of leisure to actually be involved in government that substantial wealth affords. There's a reason that we have certain family dynasties in politics, the Bushes, the Kennedys, the Clintons, um, maybe someday the Obamas, I don't know. Um, in part, it's because those families have enough wealth that their kids grow up in top schools, usually New England boarding schools. They go to the most prestigious universities and they don't need to scrap for their money. And so leadership kind of is in vain there, or is in their in their veins. Um, <coughs> that at least is the argument I heard. Uh, that that was uh, that argument. Oh, where was it? It was uh, it was a speech made at a, uh, President H. W. Bush's funeral that kind of spelled that idea out. That the Bush family dynasty began with H. W. Bush's father, who was a he was like a fourth generation senator. And he trained his son to go into politics, but the requirement was he had to be very successful in business first. And he had to have built on the family capital such that they would be, he would not be beholden to special interest. But each generation had done that, so the whole family is continually building their wealth and then going into politics. And that, that's still part of the Bush dynasty to this day. And it's it, uh, for those examples especially – it's really difficult to tie the blame to ethnicity or like any of those other religion or any of those other factors that the report or the annual annual review pointed out because those things seem to be relatively consistent between those those families that you mentioned. It's I think that's a that's a stronger warrant for wealth or intergenerational accumulation of wealth. It's a lot better of a case in those examples. In which case, I think that could that could then democracy, equality, and fairness. All of those could look at the fact that. You should not – Neg – AF would be looking at a more idealistic framework for those three. Neg would be looking at a more real-world understanding of those three, that fairness okay. does not just mean everyone starts in the economy with $100,000. Fairness means that there is a common framework of rule of law that everyone is under, whether you're rich or poor, with everyone having the opportunity to rise. This and, is equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. Exactly. Or reversed. And yeah. reversed. That's neg F. Make it F neg. Yeah. yeah. That's oh. a great, that is, that is the very reason why this is a Jordan Peterson debate. <laughs> that, is, well, that is like, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to push back on JP just a little bit because uh, this argument is way older than Jordan Peterson. I mean, this is something that people have been arguing about since Athens versus Sparta. I mean, like, should you have uh, should we have all citizens be able to vote? That's the Athenian version, though. They're all citizens means all Greek male property owners <laughs> were citizens <laughs> versus Athenians or, or versus the Spartans who said, yeah, no. The king says what he does, and he listens to the soldiers, and uh, that that's about it. Uh, now, one other value that <coughs> um, I think is primarily – I see this one as being much more neg-leaning naturally, but could be bent towards AF, I suppose – would be a value of economic progress. And this would be okay. looking more at the fact that the nature of <laughs> building wealth is such that you build wealth – wealth is built generationally – so that the first generation of a family, so I'll just use um, I'll, I'll I'll just use my own family history to to illustrate this, and then tell me what you think. Okay. Um, uh, so my dad was born in Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, my granddaddy was a jack of all trades, no college degree, a fantastic plumber, electrician, mechanic type person. Uh, my dad grew up in a string of trailer homes, and they moved all all, all over the place. He, he told me when I was little, <laughs> when you have a mobile home, you just move the house every six months. It's, it's just what <laughs> you do. Now, my dad went on to college and went into a profession, uh, the ministry, and uh, has been able to make a lot of strong financial moves because he's had a single stable career. 
Uh, so because of that, he's currently quite upset that a lot of his retirement just tanked in the uh, the stock market uh, dip mm, a few months yeah. over the last three months. So, but that's the kind of wealth that his father never had to worry about. Um, now, because my dad made some of those moves, I was able to basically <coughs> start adult life in the up in the middle to upper middle class position in terms of private liberal arts college education, uh, go on to pursue graduate school without a crippling amount of debt, and then instead of entering the workforce at a minimum wage job and kind of going on the blue-collar route, I entered the workforce into teaching and over seven years have continued to kind of follow that career trajectory. All of that, uh, just as a way to say that, like, my generational, my economic progress, because at the age of 31, I own a house, I own two car my wife and I own our house, we own two cars without debt, mostly, we're going to finish paying off the current car note in uh, July, and I'll be done with PhD, again, without debt, without much debt, uh, within two years. So all of that to say, my economic progress, I didn't start where my dad did. My dad made some moves, and then I started just a little bit below where I grew up, and 10 years of being on my own, I'm now basically, my wife and I live the same kind of lifestyle that I lived growing up, but it took my dad a lot more work to get there. So that's really, I would argue, <coughs> that's the way that economic progress is made. It's not a, now there are, of course, your exceptions, there are the people who invent cool things or uh, write new programs or start amazing websites and suddenly Jeff Bezos is the world's richest man and so on. But by and large, most people progress economically through that sort of each generation building on the previous one. And it's a small step forward kind of economic growth. And that, so I think that should be, that really could become a huge framework for the NEG. What do okay. you think? So. How do you can you tie the connection between that and n not being antithetical to democracy? Because and it's going to go back to the phrase you introduced a moment ago: uh, equality of opportunity versus equality of means. So it's the uh, it's not antithetical to democracy because every person has the same opportunity to do that. Everybody has the opportunity. This is why we have anti discrimination laws in hiring practices. This is why across states and at federal level. Uh, your ability to earn money is it's taxed evenly to a certain degree, and then <coughs> it's also limitless. So it's not like there's a cap oh, okay. where – so everybody can do that. And this also – now the econo – that economic progress that I'm talking about is where I think the biggest – uh, argument on neg is going to be really looking at how this how af harms families um, this economic progress is tied to existing family structures that transfer property and assets down the line through families so it requires marriage and it requires um, parents to actually transfer their wealth to their children upon death now, if you get rid of that, you also loosen one of the last real ties that holds families together in a strong way. So you could also that <clears throat> the economic progress I'm describing is linked directly to stability. Yeah. And here's like I just thought of this, too. Tell me what you think of this. Going back to the word antithetical. Antithetical, is, I think, on behalf of the writers of the resolution, is a very intentionally polarized phrase. Mm -hmm. And um when you think about it, affirmative has to has to affirm and prove that the transfer or the intergenerational accumulation of wealth is antithetical. That is a strong word. The negative can come back and be and let's assume affirmative is taking a stance like an equality stance, equality of outcome sort of thing. It's like the the reason we're not getting a better level of equality of outcome is because of this intergenerational accumulation of wealth. Negative can come back and say, is there inequality? Like, or like, they'll make you the entire argument for economic progress, like you said, that like most people accumulate wealth this way. And you gave the example of Jeff Bezos. Is he an example of inequality of uh, or income inequality? Um, yeah. Like, if there was ever an example of income inequality, it'd probably be Jeff Bezos. Does that mean that it's antithetical? No. Like, can inequality still exist in the system and it not be 
polarized, dead opposite antithetical. It's like, yeah, like you can have even the top 5% being massively rich doesn't mean that the economic progress is literally the antithesis of democracy. It just means, yeah, inequality exists, but generally it's a pretty good democratic system. So Nang has a lot of wiggle room there. Affirmative needs to, to, to affirm a polarized position on this, which I think puts a much heavier burden on the affirmative. But at the same time, the affirmative has a lot of literature to back it up. So you might be able to weave around that a little bit. So well done writing this resolution, honestly, because that this is one of those things where affirmative has to <clears throat> to prove something pretty big, but they have a really, a really great way to go about doing it. And the neg can, can pick what part of that they want to refute. And if they take that part down, they've, they've ruined the word antithetical for the affirmative. And like, that's a bat, that's a massive burden of proof and the resolution to prove that something is polar opposite or completely the antithesis of. So that's what, what do you think? Oh, I, I, I think you're right. And I think that the, the only thing I would want to add on the, the Bezos point is that Bezos is an example of inequality that is opposed to democracy only if it is legally prohibiting, if the law forbids anyone else from rising to be Jeff Bezos' equal. And we literally have a system, no one person made Jeff Bezos so rich. Uh, the didn't, law didn't what, make... Didn't you, did you, this may not have been you, but don't you, didn't you know someone that lived next to Jeff Bezos? Oh, I was going to bring this up. Yeah, uh, it's my brother, uh, Chris. Okay. He, uh, he lived on, Jeff Bezos has a house on Mercer Island in Seattle. Uh, my brother, Chris, lived out in Seattle for two years. He worked for a company there called Pushpay. Uh, he's, he, is, he works with a uh, nonprofit Christian group called um, uh, Young Life. My brother, Chris, does, not Bezos. And mm -hmm. uh, Young Life, because of the work he did with Young Life, uh, Chris got to be one of, I think, eight or 12 guys who were all splitting rent on this giant mansion on Mercer Island. I mean, like, which also, as a side note, is another great example of how income inequality is not <laughs> nearly as simple as you might think. Yeah. Somebody who yeah. has just moved to a big city and is fresh out of college uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have no access to other things. There's all there's all kinds of other institutions and other arrangements. So it's not nearly as simple. Chris partners with Young Life. They tell him, hey, we actually have a giant donor who loves Young Life. And he lets our guys rent his house at, at cost to him. So instead of rent being like $10,000 a month, <laughs> eight guys were splitting, I think it was like four or $5,000 a month. And so it, it became something much more affordable. Anyway, he's living on this island, and uh, turns he calls me a few weeks in. He's like, "By the way, Jeff Bezos lives like down the street," and I about no. died. It's like, why can't I? Why still? Why can't I believe you? Why am I still I, unable I, to accept Seriously, this? I, <laughs> like at some point, I'm sure so you'll meet times. Chris, and you'll have to ask him. But like, this is just so crazy. I I told him he needed to get a dog just so that he could walk his dog and meet Jeff Bezos while Jeff is walking his dog. Just for the fun of being like, oh yeah, Jeff, how's your dog? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you want to oh, give man. me like a million bucks because you got so much? I mean, that'd be cool. <laughs> he, he hey, did we have not... an organization. Would you like to be a donor? Yeah, he, he, he did not ever, uh, I, I don't know if he ever even talked to Bezos, but he, he lived like down the street. That is so cool. Which also is another great illustration of democracy in action, because in an aristocracy, the poor do not live anywhere near the rich. And in, in America, that often does happen, but there's no law preventing it. It is often the case that we have poor sections, rich sections, white sections, black sections. Um, by and large, we've gotten rid of all of the laws that used to segregate cities, uh, we actually have a lot more legal equality than we ever did. And today, uh, if anybody can prove discrimination in lending practices, uh, they, they can take a bank to court so fast. I mean, it, it's, it is, it's really not worth it for a bank to hold on to their old, old prejudices anymore. So all that mm -hmm. to say, like that, that's another piece of democracy in reality, I think. Okay, uh, we need to make a choice real quick. Uh, do, do we, uh, and we're just going to think out loud on the episode, I suppose. Uh, okay. do we want to just make this a long episode or do we want to call it there and come back later and talk about arguments? Cause we're at an hour. We will come back and talk about arguments. This is going to be a two part. 
All right, that that yeah. sounds good to me because uh, I I think we have done a really good job laying the uh, just discussing the basic pieces of the resolution and the values and uh, the different ideas, and we should definitely come back and uh, and and do that. Uh, okay, so uh, Ethan, if people want to get in touch with us, how do they do that? If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at what's the res at gmail.com. That's W H A T S T H E R E S at gmail.com. You can DM us on Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit at what's the res underscore, or check out our website where you can find all of this information and all of our previous episodes at www.whatstheres.com. And until next time, where we will be discussing arguments, work hard, speak well, and seek the truth.